thank you all for coming. The motto of this group is get it on paper. Don't tell me about it unless you're going to go home and write it and come back and share it, right? Now, we have to say, not just get it on paper, but get it on your desktop. Um, we don't get to decide in this class what your story is. You don't get to decide what my story is. We honor each other's stories. Now, today is not going to be a lot of happy, fun stuff. It's going to be some sad stuff, but interesting stuff, and there are threads that run through our stories. I hope you'll find that. You'll know. And we're going to get started with our first presenter, who is Alice Mass. One of my goals after I stopped working was to write memories of my life. I was spurred on when a year ago I told my 10-year-old grandson Noah about my years living in the South. He sat with rapt attention as I told him about my experiences of segregation in Tennessee. In the, 19, in the 1950s, I told him how black and white people could not go to the same restaurants, movie theaters, and even had to drink from separate water fountains. When I was finished with the story, Noah was visibly touched. I realized I had shared not only my life, but an important part of history with him. Life moves on, and eight months ago, my husband and I moved to Chapel Hill after living most of our lives in New York City. Now I had the time to start a writing class, but where? I read the newcomer's website, and my eye was drawn to the personal history writing class on the shared learning link. I asked if I could sit in on a class. Yes, came the reply. As a matter of fact, Bobby Luckler, the leader of our class, offered to drive me there. I felt so welcomed as we were just starting to meet a whole new bunch of friends down here. When I walked into the room, I discovered a group of intelligent, vibrant men and women eager to share their stories with each other. I took notes at that first visit as ideas popped into my mind, just listening to the writing and the conversations that took place afterwards. Without pausing, I joined the group. Under Bobby's able and warm, respectful environment, I immediately felt at home. Since I have joined, I increasingly, increasingly feel a bond with my classmates because as diverse as our stories might seem, there is in fact a common thread of experiences that appear, and I see the commonality of our lives on many levels. Funny, touching, sad, all stories are shared and enjoyed. I find it a safe place to reveal things about myself. One is my age. How can I write my personal history, I thought, and not tell when I was born? I was born in Brooklyn in March 1945, just months before World War II ended. From my perspective, life was glorious after post-war era. As soon as consumer manufacturing resumed, my parents bought a television set, and a brand new, new DeSoto sedan. The television set was a novelty which entranced us all. It sat in a place of honor between, um, in the living room. I especially loved to watch the pattern which appeared on the screen between programs. My favorite show was the Howdy Doody show, which came on in the late afternoon. I loved to go roller skating with my best friend Annie. I remember sitting on the stoop of our row house and diligently adjusting the skates to fit my feet with my shoes on and then using the key to tighten the skates so it fits snugly and wouldn't come off. Balancing while on the skates was a challenge that often ended in scraped knees, but we weren't deterred. My father had a laundry business, which before and during the war was very successful. All was well until washers and then dryers became popular items for the home. My father saw the future of home laundering and knew his business was not a part of that future. When we moved to Tennessee, we too bought a washing machine. We kept it in the garage as it used to shake much too vigorously on the spin cycle. 
When the weather was nice, we put the wet clothes from the washer in a laundry basket and brought it to the clothesline in the backyard. There I always helped my mother use wooden clothespins to hang the clothes on the line to dry. I loved to watch the sheets blow in the breeze. As we were packing to move here, I sorted through my boxes of memorabilia and found the dog tag I had worn when I was six or seven years old. It was silver metal, and I had worn it on a chain around my neck. It had my name, address, and a J on the bottom for Jewish, so I could be correctly identified in case of an attack. At that age, the world situation of the Cold War with Russia did not really make an impression on me. Russia? Bomb? Let's play baseball was all my friends and I could say. I recently received an e-card with the song America the Beautiful playing in the background as stunning pictures of America on, flashed on the screen. Tears welled up in my eyes and I felt a deep pride in my country. It brought back memories of lining up in the hall in elementary school a couple of times a week to go to the music room where we were taught and practiced patriotic songs. Post-war America definitely influenced the person I am today. How has being a member of personal history class helped me write? I am able to take these seemingly disparate memories and put them in a context of world history. To me, it gives my life experiences a clearer perspective. I am grateful to have found this class and to have this opportunity to read today. Right. Our next speaker is, is Tammy Schenk. Tammy. OK. <clears throat> I called this segment of my memoirs From the Frying Pan into the Fire, and it takes place between 1943 and 1944. World War II raged across Europe. Destruction, death, famine, and incredible suffering spread from the Atlantic coast of France deep onto the steppes of Russia. <clears throat> On June 22, 1941, Hitler's army, called the Wehrmacht, began its drive to the east by invading Ukraine on its way to Moscow. There was little resistance since Ukrainians believed the German army would liberate them from Russian communist rule. Following Stalin's scorched earth policy, the Red Army destroyed large areas of Ukrainian land and resources before they were taken over by the Germans. They burned crops, blew up bridges, killed whatever livestock, horses, chickens, ducks, sheep, or goats, that they could not haul off for their own use. When the Russians subsequently drove the, Soviet, uh, the Nazis out of Ukraine in 1943, the Wehrmacht in return destroyed everything the Soviets had not. These were bad times for the Ukrainian population. Between starvation, deportation, or death during bombings, it is said that nearly 10 million Ukrainians, including 600,000 Ukrainian Jews were killed during World War II. We were familiar with the Soviet cruelty and total disregard for the welfare of the population of Ukraine. On the other hand, this being 1939 to 1944, there was no internet, no cell phones, actually no phones at all, no TV in rural Ukraine. Radios were a rarity, even in larger cities. News spread slowly, so we had little information about Hitler or the Nazis, and it wasn't until much later when we became aware of Hitler's intentions. The time had come for our family to make a major decision. Do we stay and continue to suffer under Stalin's rule and inhumane living conditions, or do we take the courageous step to escape the Soviet stronghold, a stranglehold, and flee with the retreating Nazis in the hope of escaping their clutches once we were in the Western Europe. Uh, we were not Nazi sympathizers by, 
but simply wanted a chance for a better life and freedom from Soviet oppression. We had that choice because of a singular circumstance. My uncle Sergei was married to Erika, who was of Volga, Volga German descent. During the rule of Catherine the Great, a German princess who married the Russian Tsar Peter the Great, thousands of, Ru of German nationals emigrated to Russia between 1763 and 1767, mainly to the Volga River Delta. There, there they pursued the opportunity of freedom, local self-government, and better living conditions. As promised by Catherine's manifesto, after the Russian Revolution, the Volga Germans endured increasing privations and suffered persecution from the Soviet government and its citizens. During World War II, many Volga Germans were rounded up and forcibly transported to Siberia. Some fled, <clears throat> others remained, my aunt's family among them. Now these German descendants were, dis were suspected by the Soviets of aiding the Nazis, and life became more dangerous every day. Uncle Sergei and my mother's, uh, my mother's youngest brother and, and Erika decided they had to leave with the retreating army. The Germans encouraged the Volga Germans to leave because they needed workers in the armament factories back home. My family had no German ancestry, but found it judicious to find one. There was no telling if perhaps a child had been born to a German slash Ukrainian union many years ago. We had to escape from the Soviet Union. Our experience with the occupying German army had actually been a positive one. The two doctors stationed in our home were kind, generous young men who missed their families and often played with us children and shared their food rations with us, and we were very grateful. The wrenching decision to leave behind family, friends, and our homeland was made knowing we would probably never see our loved ones again. Our parents packed two suitcases with personal clothing and a few items from the meager possessions we had. A metal double bed and a wicker footlocker filled with some linen, dishes, cutlery, and a couple of pots and pans was all we could bring for two adults and two children. I still have the sturdy 70-year-old basket as a reminder of things past. Departure day arrived in August 1943. Our baggage was loaded into the wagon car of the train assigned to us and three other families. We bid goodbye to heartbroken parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, friends, and neighbors. Before leaving the house, <clears throat> we followed the Russian custom where everyone has to sit down for good luck and to ensure a return. The tradition persists to this day. It must be true because my parents were able to visit my grandparents in the mid-1980s before grandmother and grandfather passed away. My sister and I returned in, in 2004 to see cousins and their families. What a wonderful reunion we had, but that will be a, a future story. Our train left Kramatorsk in August 43, loaded with Nazi soldiers and us refugees. It would take three months to cross into Poland and to arrive at our first destination in Lodz. The trip was a nightmare. The Red Army was in hot pursuit and bombarded the tracks daily. The train was sidelined repeatedly and we would leave the wagon to hide in the fields or forests. Sometimes it would be days before the tracks were repaired and we could resume the journey. Special troop trains had priority over ours and we'd be stuck for even longer. Luckily, it was summer and early fall, so we did not have to worry about freezing to death and could scrounge around the villages or countryside for food and not suffer as much as later refugees did. Upon arrival in Lodz, we were housed in a refugee camp and my father and uncle assigned work in the city. 
The refugee camp was located near the Chelmo concentration camp, which held Jewish prisoners until the authorities decided to which extermination camp they could be taken. Rumors frequently spread through our camp that refugees from Ukraine would suffer the same fate as the Jews or to be sent to Siberia. After a couple of months, our families were moved to an apartment building in city center where we shared our apartment with two or three other families. The large rooms were divided by blankets strung up on clotheslines. We shared the kitchen and the one bathroom, but it was much better than the refugee camp, so we were happy. The German army prepared to evacuate from Poland, and our families were once again on the move, this time to West Germany. My father and uncle were skilled workers and were hired by Telefunken, a manufacturer of transmitters and radio sets before the war. During World War II, they produced vacuum tubes, transmitters, radio relay systems, and, and radio directional finders for the German air defense. We arrived in Ulm during the autumn of 1944. There's another principle here. Uh, my new friend Nancy and I were talking about the difference between um, autobiography and memoir, and she knew, and I didn't, so I learned that today. But um, when I first got into this group, everybody thought you had to start on September 1st, 1900, and write, mm -hmm. and some of us began to write episodically, and that makes it easier to get on paper because it's not so overwhelming. Um, Roger Spencer is our next reader. So I hope you could hear my voice as usually pretty loud anyway, but you're going to have to back up a bit chronologically for this. It's called Flight. Those of you who have watched Downton Abbey are familiar with the New Year celebration of, of 1925, which ended the final episode. In that year, my mother was just 19, single, and an au pair for a well-to-do family in England. The experience grounded her in the English language, one of five she spoke fluently, and made her a lifelong Anglophile. It probably saved her life, too, and her husband, her parents, and her children. But I'm getting ahead of my story. In my earliest years, I associated parks and travel with holidays and vacations. We would go to the Schönbrunn Palace Gardens or the Vienna Woods on a weekend afternoon and to Baden or the Alps for longer vacations. There are snapshots of my sister wearing a dirndl skirt and me in lederhosen with the mountains in the background looking very happy. We never expected to have to run for our lives from Vienna and Austria, let alone from Europe to Africa. My mother was the only one in our family who felt this sense of urgency to leave at once or stay where we were and die. The only choices were Palestine, Shanghai, or Tanganyika. She wanted to go to an English-speaking place that, along with Kenya and Uganda, was known as British East Africa. My father didn't want to leave his surgical practice in Vienna or the vicinity of Budapest, where his aging father, older sister, and younger brother lived. And this was in spite of his having been denounced by a patient and detained by the Gestapo, who had raided and ransacked our apartment in Vienna, stealing half of our savings, which were hidden in a cotton ball in my father's medicine cabinet. The other half was still in its hiding place in the hem of a heavy drape where my mother had inserted it and sewed it over. That money paid for our passage out of Austria. All of this had happened after Hitler marched triumphantly into Austria, his birthplace, in March of 1938. 
My mother could see the handwriting on the wall even before Kristallnacht, which was six months off. My father had relatives in New York, but it was too late to start the process and get on the Hungarian quota. My mother was eventually able to get herself, my older sister and I, on the Austrian quota, which was not as long, but it would be three years before we could get visas to come to the United States and e even longer for my father. My recollections of our departure from Vienna when I was a little over four years old are still vivid. Trieste is not very far from Vienna by train, a day's trip to the southwest, and before World War I it was part of Austria, not Italy. The locomotive taking us there was the largest, loudest, and blackest monster I had ever seen and very scary when I saw it pull into the station. I remember little about our embarkation on the Duquesta d'Aosta, a smallish steamship that plied the Mediterranean on its way to the Suez Canal and the east coast of Africa. Besides us, it carried only a few passengers mostly prostitutes on their way to North Africa. They were inspired by Mussolini to perform their patriotic duty with the boys in the Italian army, which was winning, winning the lopsided war against Haley Selassie in Abyssinia. I don't recall much about our stops at Port Suez or Aden. It took perhaps a week or 10 days to reach Mombasa the largest port on the coast of Kenya, where we disembarked for the three-day journey by rail to Lake Victoria in the center of Africa. How the town of Mavanza on the southern shore of Lake Victoria got to be our home for the next year is a story in itself, which I won't tell now except to say that a small German colony remained in Tanganyika after the Germans lost World War I and they were now heading back to Germany, anticipating the beginning of another war. Among them was a doctor who had been, Dr. Schuppler, who had been implicated in the murder of the Austrian Chancellor Dolphus by the Nazis in 1934. He had built a small house and medical practice which he now wanted to sell. The house and the yard around it were full of vermin, scorpions, and snakes, and the primitive medical equipment consisted mainly of an unshielded x-ray machine. We slept under mosquito netting, but that didn't prevent us all getting malaria. One vivid memory is of the enormous green and red spiders which made their home on the high ceiling of our bedroom, beyond the reach or concern of any of the natives who did the chores around the house and helped my father with his practice. In the wet season, it would pour rain for weeks, but the rest of the year, it was too sunny and hot for man, woman, or child to go out without a cork helmet. Mango and papaya trees grew in the back and bore delicious fruit. We tried raising chicks, but the snakes and weasels got them first. When a plague of locusts filled the air outside for days so thick they'd get inside your clothes, we stayed indoors while the shirtless natives happily caught and ate them alive or roasted them over a fire. A teenager named Nianda taught me Swahili. The British colony had a clubhouse where they would show Shirley Temple and Mickey Mouse movies on weekends to all comers. When I wasn't sick with malaria, I learned as much English from these movies as from King Arthur's Knights of the Round Table, which my mother ordered from a correspondence school. It was another year before we moved to Dar es Salaam, where my father was the medical director of the Lady Alicia, or Alice, Aga Khan Maternity Hospital, and my sister and I were enrolled in an Anglo-American school. Mary Friedman is our next speaker. I was three years old when I felt the tension in the car. Uncle Lou, Uncle Lou. I associated him with our trip to Florida in, 19, in December 1941. Mother's youngest brother, Lou, had volunteered to join the Seabees to rebuild the damaged base in Pearl Harbor. 
His brother, my uncle Phil, a dentist serving in, as an army captain, ironically lost his four front teeth when his English hospital was bombed by the Nazis. My father received his draft notice in 1943, but he knew he would not pass the physical. In 1928, Dad almost lost his leg when a car jumped the curb and smashed into him. Instead, he became the air raid warden and volunteer fireman, patrolling the streets to make sure all the lights were out and the black shades were drawn, and racing to fires at 3 a.m. in the morning in our little town of North Belmore. Dad worked as a traffic manager for the Joe Lowe Corporation in the Starrett Lehigh Building, which is on the, the, the uh, display right there, on 26th Street and 12th Avenue in New York City, overlooking Pier 66. Any of you who know New York know that 12th Avenue is the street right next to the piers. Its unique design allowed freight cars to move directly off the piers and up 30-foot elevators to loading docks on each floor. This gave the truck drivers easy access to all the 19 stories. It proved a perfect place for German spies watching the comings and goings of ships in the New York Harbor. One day, Dad called Mom to say the FBI had surrounded their building, rounding up suspects in what they called the Duquesne spy ring. I later, later learned that Axel Weaver, Wheeler Hill, a truck driver, obtained information for Germany regarding the ships sailing to Britain from New York Harbor. He operated a radio set for sending coded messages to Germany from the roof of the building. <laughs> he also encouraged members of the spy ring to secure data and arrange contacts between various German agents. At home, my mother was a community organizer. She lobbied the school board to use WAP, WPA funds for a nursery school to be built in the basement of the elementary school. In our town of North Belmore, Long Island, many of the women worked at the Grumman and Republic aviation plants. They needed full-time care for their children. Although mom was not working on the assembly line, she made sure that I attended the nursery school until I started first grade at five. On the home front, shortages and racing, let me just, On the home front, shortages and rationing had the greatest effect on our everyday lives. Mother had to tear out ration stamps from a book to be permitted to purchase a pound of meat, a stick of butter, or a pound of sugar. These products were needed to feed the millions of soldiers serving around the world. Without these stamps, you couldn't buy these things. I'm sure there were black market sources, but my family stuck by the rules. Mother next volunteered with the Nassau Consumers Union to help people manage their food budgets. Now, Mother was great at, finan at the financial part. She'd been a bookkeeper. But recipes were another story. I, I accompanied her to a local radio station in Freeport where she was invited to speak. Mother, one of eight children, had lost her father at nine. She started working full time at age 15 to support her brothers in school. As a result, she was a mediocre cook at best. She relied on government pamphlets from the Department of Agriculture since she couldn't advise people on how best to use the food allotted. Instead, instead of giving her advice on preparing foods, which she couldn't cook herself. <laughs> the war affected everything in our daily lives. Our victory garden gave us yummy fresh vegetables during the summer and yucky canned vegetables in the winter. First, we planted radishes, corns, beef, beets, and root crops. After they were harvested, we planted peas, string beans, cucumbers, tomatoes, and corn. I love picking the peas. To this day, I have not eaten a pea as delicious as I remember from that fresh garden. 
food in the supermarket just doesn't compare with the tomatoes and corn freshly picked. Mother would sterilize mason jars in a pot on the stove, cook the vegetables, pour them in jars, and seal them with paraffin. We took them to the Schutzman's house next door to a cold storage sub-basement, and this I remember very vividly. We would climb down the cellar stairs, pull a large ring in the middle of the floor, and then we would descend more steps down to a small room filled with shelves on all the walls. I re rarely remember retrieving them once they were down there, but we must have because we did eat during the winter months. We had a chicken coop, as did our neighbors. We set up our coop as an attachment to our garage with an outside fenced area where the chickens could run. To reach the nest in the garage, I had to crawl through a small opening leading from the chicken's yard to gather the eggs. Sunday was chicken, freshly killed by dad and plucked by mom. The item that I felt most deprived of was butter. I hated the margarine substitute, a white stick which you could color by squeezing a yellow dye bubble. It tasted nothing <laughs> like butter. I learned to spread my butter, but any butter I had so very thin so we would not have to use any of that horrible tasting stuff. Dad rode his bicycle to the railroad station so mom could use the car ration stamps. If she had enough gas, mom could take us to Jones Beach. There we could forget about the war and enjoy a beautiful summer day. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you my story. It's a home front story also. Uh, when we were planning this, we thought, um, yeah, the war had effects other than in Europe and in Japan. My story is called Letters from Home. The wars in Europe and the Pacific ground on endlessly. Six of my uncles and cousins went to war. Five came home. My father was a skosh too old. Everything was scarce. Sugar, meat, butter, shoes, gasoline were all rationed. I had one pair of shoes that I had not outgrown. My little white summer sandals were not going to cut it in the days of 1944's winter as they, those days got shorter and colder. I put on two pairs of socks, my little white sandals, and my synthetic galoshes, and went off to school dressed about as well as anybody else. The letter arrived the day before Thanksgiving. As mother read, she started to weep. She handed the letter to daddy. He read it aloud to me. Dear Cricket, Robert, and Bobby. Cricket was my mother's nickname. Now that my 18th birthday has passed, I have been called into the U.S. Army. I'll go before Christmas. With personal car gasoline rationing, you cannot drive home for Christmas. Papa and Mama need to see you. Since Papa can't drive, I enclose the ration stamps for our tractor gasoline with the hope that you can come to visit. Robert, Papa thinks you're a smart man so I hope you can help them figure out what to do on the farm and everything. I've left my 1937 Chevrolet with cousin Chug King and we wanted you all to have the tractor gas. I'll write when I get settled in. Your loving baby brother, Carmen King. And so, on the day after Christmas, I, wearing my brand new rationed, unrationed, plastic penny loafers, with my mother and dad using the precious tractor gasoline, drove with a full tank of gas from Lexington, Kentucky to the village of Hillside, Hillsdale, Simpson County, Kentucky, to visit my grandparents, Papa and Mama, Ed and Mary King. We were sitting before the fire after supper. Rural electrification did not come till after the war. Mama lighted her pride and joy, her Aladdin lamp, half filled with farm available kerosene so that I could do my homework by lamplight outside the conversation circle. Papa spoke from his cane bottom chair by the fireplace. Mary, tell Cricket and Robert about the letter you wrote. My grandmother turned from the sideboard with the Bible in her hand and said, we don't know what we're going to do about the farm. Ed can't drive the tractor. 
Maud the mule has been taken into the army as an army mule. She's gone to war and there's no way to pull the plow. We can't get out the crops. We can't harvest the crops that are coming in this spring. We will have no income for two years. Yes, I know you children will help, but our lives and the ground will lie fallow. So she said, I wrote to the president. Daddy spoke quickly, the president of what? And she said, the president of the United States of America. I told him to send Carmen home. We need him on the farm. <laughs> Daddy asked another insightful question. Did the president reply? And Mama said, no, but his secretary did. She drew out of the Bible a mimeograph letter with an obscure scrawled signature from the Secretary of War. She handed the letter to Daddy, and then he handed it to me. It was a letter thanking them for sharing their son in defense of their country and freedom. And somehow, as I recall the whole scene, the old folks were satisfied that they had been heard. My grandfather was dead within two months. Carmen came home from the Philippines in August 1945 at the end of the war, not wounded, but damaged. Years later, I listened as he wept and told my father of his first post-basic training assignment. He was rousted out of bed at 2 a.m. to serve on the firing squad to execute a barracks mate who had been convicted of treason. War is hell. The siblings, teenage grandchildren, and neighbors rallied round and saved the crops. A couple of years ago, I began to wonder if my grandmother's letter could be found. I called the Roosevelt Presidential Library. The chief archivist told me that they did not find Mary King's letter, but that they found many letters very much like that saved in the library. He sent me to the Truman Library. A helpful archivist searched, no luck. He sent me to the National Military Archives. Their website is like a lot of other websites. If you already know how to do it, you're in. And if you don't, you're out. I learned that I must use Form 180. Form 180. Here's my Form 180. Right there, I have it. Ruth Ann, who is in our group, and this is why the group is important, Ruth Ann gave me a copy of Form 180 so that I did not have to search. <laughs> the search continues. Carmen King became a pastor and leader in the Methodist Church. He worked all over the South to help revive dying churches of other races and denominations. At a conference, he was the morning speaker and Billy Graham was the afternoon speaker. So everything worked out just fine. Uh, Daryl Friedman, who is our videographer and um, organizer. Basic setting, 1942, around that. I'm about um, six or seven years old, around that time frame. Long Island, New York, a rural area called Franklin Square. Our family crowded around every evening to listen to the radio news, and the news was always kind of somber. I didn't understand the news, I was only six. But the, but the conversation, but the tone of their voices was very upsetting. Mother and dad sounded scared and unsure of what would come next. Dad told us that if the war wasn't ended soon, he'd have to leave us. He's going to get drafted. And, he, and, and dad's somber warning jolted mother into silence. She pressed her lips tightly together, which sort of was her signal that she was scared. And she had a lot to fear. Mother was, we lived frugally in a small town in Franklin Square. <coughs> Our family didn't socialize with anyone and, uh, and in the neighborhood, and mother didn't, didn't drive. She depended on dad for everything. If anything went wrong, she was stuck. She had to call dad, and dad was working. So it was a real problem. If dad went to war, there'd be nobody to call. Uh, the specter of dad's possible draft really scared her. The radio news was always about the war. In school, we were told to save our nickels and dimes for war bonds, conserve food, and recycle newspapers, and kitchen fats. Somehow kitchen fats were being used for something, whatever. I remember my second grade teacher, my second grade class, giggling 
over the poster announcing, ladies, bring your fat cans to the butcher. <laughs> At home, we planted a victory garden and raised about a dozen chickens for eggs and for Sunday dinner. Dad avoided the draft by taking a job at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Mother never did socialize with her neighbors, but since we sold them eggs and jointly participated in the recycle ventures, uh, we, got to, we got to know them enough to say hello when we passed them in the street. Christmas came, and so did a problem that we didn't anticipate. The trouble started when we acknowledged Christmas and Hanukkah with a, with a tree in our living room and a menorah in our window. Our friendly neighbors became less friendly when they realized that we were Jewish. My elementary school education became augmented by my classmates, who told me that the Jews killed Jesus and held me personally responsible for, for, the, for the Second World War. A few more of the more aggressive students took that as their duty to waylay me after school knock me to the ground and break my glasses. In those days, glasses were made of glass, and they really broke when you, when you were knocked down. Their philosophy and violence didn't bother my teachers or the principal, but they sure bothered me a lot. Dad stormed into the school, demanded to see the principal. Dad suggested that I get dismissed 10 minutes early so that I could get a head start. The principal agreed, and the problem was solved. The unintended consequence was the whole school knew that I was that Jew boy that got out of school early. Every Saturday, I was allowed to, go to, the, to walk to the movies as long as I took my sister, my little sister. I had a problem on our own street, and it was with our neighbors. There were people on our block that didn't like Jews. Their houses, uh, and, they, and they knew that we were Jewish. When Marianne and I would, go to, would get near their houses, we'd look and see if we could see anybody around the house. If we could see the, the, the woman of the house, we'd cross to the other side of the street. But once I goofed, and the mother of the house ran out of her house and started screaming at me, and Marianne screamed at us, Jews are not allowed on our property. She said, get on, it's not, and I would shout back, it's not your property. It's, it's, the sidewalk belongs to everyone, but she kept on yelling. And I was six years old. The sidewalk, the, she continued yelling, and I said things that I just can't remember. But Marion and I slowly moved away. I held my sister's hand tightly, not so much as to reassure her, but to keep my hand from trembling. Paul has written his autobiography. And he's sharing it with us, piece by piece. And that's different from just writing it, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. And we're good, aren't we? Yes. yes. <laughs> Come on. <clears throat> I was born May 21st, 1934, in Vienna, Austria, into a well-to-do family. We lived on the first floor, above the lobby floor, in a very nice apartment had a full-time governess to take care of my every needs. My grandfather, Shia Hirsch, or Herman, came to Vienna in 1898. After three years in the Austrian army, he tried his hand at several businesses and finally decided on selling secondhand furniture. He became very successful at this and eventually owned several furniture stores. Okay, uh, in fact, this is very quickly my family. That's my grandmother on the left. My father is with a circle around him there. This was taken in 1916. My father was 12. Uh, my Aunt Ella behind him, my Uncle Robert to the left, my Uncle Fred on the bottom, and my great aunt uh, Charlotte on the left with her son. Uh, it so happened that my mother grew up in the apartment building directly across the street and my father and mother could see each other from their bedroom windows. All four of the children received advanced degrees in college, which was very unusual back then. My father, the oldest, became a lawyer. Next, my Aunt Ella became a pharmacist. My Uncle Robert, a chemist. And the youngest, my Uncle Fritz, or Fred, became an architect. This was in the 1920s and 1930s. 
My parents were married December 28, 1930 in the main synagogue in Vienna, Stad Hempel. Fortunately, the Nazis could not destroy this synagogue as they had done to almost every other one because it was in the middle of a block of attached apartment houses and they would have had to destroy these as well. I have a pair of ruby colored vases, I believe a, a check that they got as a wedding present. I was told that I put a real scare into my parents when I was a baby. I apparently crawled over the railing of my crib fell on the floor and rolled under the crib without making a sound. The next morning, my parents could not find me for a while and thought I had been kidnapped. <laughs> Life was very nice. My father was a successful young lawyer. We took family vacations. My mother or the governess took me to play in one of the local parks. We were a young, well-to-do, happy family. All this changed abruptly on March 12, 1938, when Austria and Germany formed a union. Old Austrians like to say that they were invaded by Germany. That is a lie. When Hitler entered Vienna on March 14, Austrians lined the streets cheering. I was no longer allowed to play in any of the parks because I was Jewish. Fortunately for me, I was too young to understand what was happening around me. When I went back to Vienna many years later on an A.G. Edwards incentive trip, I saw a huge concrete bunker, perhaps 10 stories high, taking up a good part of Ironburg Park where I used to play. They can't take that down without demolishing several blocks of apartment buildings. It is a good reminder for the Viennese. For my family, coming events were a disaster. My uncle Fred had communist leanings at that time. He was arrested in May 1938. Since my father was a lawyer, my grandfather asked him to go to the police station and get him out. They arrested my father also right there on May 25th. He was sent to the concentration camp at Dachau on May 31st. He was kept there until September 23rd and then transferred to Buchenwald. Mm. He was finally released on December 26th and told that he must leave Austria in a few weeks or he will be rearrested. At this time, these concentration camps were not yet set up for mass murder, but a guard could kill you if you looked at him the wrong way. The camps were slave labor camps where you were worked to exhaustion. I was barely four years old at this time. My mother and I were kicked out of our beautiful apartment because a Nazi officer wanted it. We could only take what we could carry, leaving our favorite furniture and everything else for the Nazi. We had to move in with friends. My grandfather's furniture stores were seized and all the furniture taken away. He was forced to sell the apartment building at a ridiculously low price to a Nazi. My mother had somehow cleverly gotten paperwork together to get my father out of concentration camp. When he arrived at the apartment where we were now staying, after losing 60 pounds, I did not recognize him. I was now four and a half years old, and I did not recognize my own father. My parents now had to plead with the American consulate to get the paperwork so my father could leave so he would not be rearrested. He finally did leave for the U.S. from the port of Rotterdam, Netherlands, on the SS Van Damme on February 25, 1939, arriving in New York City on March 9. My father moved in with his aunt Sarah. He got a temporary job carrying 50-pound bags of flour and sugar for Messing Bakery. How degrading and humiliating this type of work must have been for him a good, hard-working, intelligent man. He spent every possible moment going from business to business, asking for a letter stating that he earned $20 a week. So the anti-Semitic State Department would issue my mother and I visas to come to the U.S. It took several months until he found a business owner with a heart who would give, who would give him the letter. I feel terrible for my father. He could not practice law, a field in which he had become quite successful because the laws in Austria and the U.S. are very different. Here he was in his mid-30s and his career was gone. 
After his terrible ordeal in the concentration camps, he never again, again exhibited the free, happy disposition he had previously. My mother and I had now my mother and I now had to pass a physical examination so that we would be allowed to come to the US. This is something that I remember. We both were standing naked in a room with several doctors and others present. The doors to the room opened and people passing by and having a look. What an embarrassment for my dear sweet mother. I was sensitive about having anyone touch my eyes, I still am, and would not allow the doctor to check me for trachoma, a very bad eye disease. Thus we failed the exam. When we got home, my mother hit me. That is the only time my mother ever hit me. She was so frantic and afraid of not being allowed to leave Austria. We rescheduled the exam, and this time I let the doctor examine my eyes, and we passed the exam. Mom and I left the port of Hamburg, Germany. As it turns out, this was the last ship that was allowed to leave from there. On August 4, 1939, on the SS Bremen of the North German Lloyd Lines. We arrived at the port of Hoboken, New Jersey, August 10th to start a new life. I do not remember much of this horrendous week-long voyage. My mother and I were in a tiny cabin down below somewhere, and I remember constantly throwing up. We took Ken, Steve, and Melissa, our children, to Austria in May of 1996. We went to Baden, Melk, Krems, Dürnstein, wine country, and of course spent a lot of time in Vienna. We went to my former apartment building and discovered that they were redoing the tile floor in the ent entryway of the building. This was the original floor that was there when I lived in the building. Steve took one of the tiles and stuck it in the front of his pants. He then told us, Mom and Dad, you taught me never to lie or steal, but I have to tell you, I have a tile in the front of my pants, and I cannot keep it there much longer. <laughs> Do you want it or not? <laughs> we said we definitely want it, and now have it displayed proudly in our home. I feel very fortunate that my life turned out the way it did. After starting life in Vienna, my father arrested and put in concentration camp, my grandparents murdered by the Nazis, my father and mother struggling to start a life here in the U.S., and our family essentially starting with nothing. I enjoyed and was successful in two careers. Our children and grandchildren are happy and enjoying a good life. We are retired in a nice community where we have made friends and are enjoying life. I am particularly happy that I met mom and married her. We recently celebrated our 55th wedding anniversary. Life is good. We're going halfway around the world. Clemmy, where are you? Come on. Okay. Pearl Harbor was attacked on December 7, 1941, and I was born on June 22, 1940. My memory of the war is limited, which is a blessing. There are events which left an indelible mark on my memory. Suddenly, out of nowhere, the Japanese soldiers came riding in big vehicles, carrying guns with bayonets attached and bags on their backs. This was the first time I have ever seen a truck, and the first time I have ever smelled gasoline fumes, which I thought was pleasant. I was playing with friends in my uncle's yard, Two soldiers came to see my uncle to inform him that the soldiers will use the schoolhouse as barracks and the officers will use my uncle's house. They also wanted a cow butchered for the troops. All of this I learned later when I was old, older. All requests were granted. About this time, all the able-bodied men and women have joined the American forces as guerrillas, so only women, child, children, and elderly were left in the village. Then one day, the Japanese informed us 
that they wanted to see everyone after dark in my uncle's yard. Everyone was scared. I held my mother's hand for <coughs> their life. There were several lighted torches and hanging from a tree branch was a man with both wrists tied in ropes and both feet off the ground. The neighbor who joined, the man was a neighbor who joined the guerrillas earlier. A soldier told us that the, man, that the man must be punished and the same punishment will be meted to us if we don't co cooperate. First, they beat him with their belts and hit him repeatedly with the butt, butt of their guns. The sound of the beating was the most awful sound I have ever heard. I tried to cover my ears with my mother's skirt, skirt, but the sound of the beating echoed and penetrated my brain. Then they got him down and, led, and laid him on the ground. Then the soldiers started pouring buckets of water into his mouth and face and ordered him to drink at the same time, kicking him in the stomach. There was quiet sobbing from everybody. This was called simply water torture, but also known as waterboarding. After the above episode, it was decided that we will hide in the jungle whenever the Japanese soldiers came to the village, usually at night. Several villagers were taught how to whistle like a nocturnal bird to warn the people whenever the Japanese were coming. When the whistle was heard, the adults gathered the kids and quickly and quietly we disappeared into the jungle. There was a problem, though, with the dogs. They barked and followed us to the forest, which would give away our location. With only women and the elderly, it was decided that the most human way to kill the dogs was to drown them by attaching a rock to a rope around their necks and throw them into the river. Unfortunately, an old dog of ours returned. The rope had slipped off its neck. Uh, <clears throat> off his neck. We thought it was a ghost dog, <laughs> and it was wrenching and more painful job to repeat it. Sometimes we would be in the forest several days, hiding under thick bamboo groves. We were taught not to make a sound, and somehow the babies did not cry. We could not cook because the smoke would betray our location. It was nothing to cook anyway. Then, as suddenly as they came, the Japanese soldiers left in the trucks and headed to the capital of our province with plans to meet other troops. Later, I learned, as I got older, that America was winning or had won the war. The Japanese troops were given a chance to surrender by the U.S. troops in the area, but they refused. After the Japanese soldiers left, we returned to our homes. With their refusal to surrender, the Japanese sought refuge in concrete buildings and caves. The U.S. decided to bomb our capital, which was Abra. One morning, we heard the drones of planes. We have never seen planes before. I climb a tree to get a better look. The planes started to drop huge cylindrical things, and as it hit the ground, 
There was a loud boom and, a, and huge billows of fire. Many civilians perished with the Japanese. My young mind saw only the beauty of the explosions and fire. Would I have suffered more psychological trauma if I was older and understood the ramifications of war? What do you think? I believe a young mind is a great filter. <laughs>